Well, great to see you all this morning. Uh, I'm David, uh, if you don't know me, one of the leaders here at the church. And I'd love you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 1, verse 1 to 8. And we are starting a new sermon series. We're going to be in this for a very long time. So I want to encourage you to be learning and reading through the book of Exodus. And we're going to be looking at this guy, Moses, in, in particular. Uh, the book of Exodus uh, is a book which title means a Departure or way out. We're going to meet this nation that are going to be released from slavery. Many of you will will know the story. The main character that God uses in the book is a man by the name of Moses. Uh, Has everyone heard of Moses? He's famous for... He's famous for many things. The Moses basket. We have babies in Moses baskets. He's famous for that. You may see pictures of him splitting the sea. Or God splits the sea through him. And he's famous for the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments um, that God gave to him uh, are actually the foundation of the law of this land. And uh, let's be praying for our nation that they continue to have the word of God as the foundation of the land, as we are gradually removing the foundation of the word of God from our nation, I am concerned. I heard someone this week say, it's like building a building, a beautiful building, like the West, the building of the West, and removing the foundation and expecting it to stand. Over these 40 days when we're praying and fasting, let's be praying for our nation. Just wanted to throw that in before we jump into the life of of Moses. So, Moses was born in 1525 BC, or there or thereabouts, to a man called Amran and a lady called Jochebed. Now, these two people are slaves. They're Levites, members of the tribe of Levi, and they're are slaves. So Moses essentially is born into slavery, but he finds himself adopted into the Pharaoh's household. His name means to be drawn up out of the water. And Pharaoh's daughter brings him up out of the water, adopts him, and he actually is brought up as a prince in the palace of the superpower of the day. Egypt. So he's born in, 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 into wealth, he's born into luxury, he's born into incredible um, privilege, sorry, adopted into all those things. Born into slavery and yet adopted into wealth and privilege and everything that the world had to offer back then. But when he grew up, Hebrews 11 tells us, by the grace of God he had access to his mother, Jochebed, she's an excellent woman of God, and in God's providence, this woman teaches him the word of God. And when he gets to adulthood, he has an identity crisis. The Bible says when he grew up, he started to consider, who am I? And we want the best for our children. You want your children to go a certain way in life. But when they grow up, they make their own decisions. Pharaoh raises this child, or Pharaoh's daughter raises this child, wants him to be a prince of Egypt, but he has this identity crisis. He's like, who am I? And he knows that he's not one of them. He's not one of these wealthy, powerful Egyptian princes. And the Bible says this, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, for he was looking to the reward. He had wisdom. He had foresight. He was looking to the reward. And therefore he chose to leave all the wealth and all the privilege that he had in the Egyptian palace. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to look to the reward. When I was 18, I was doing my A-levels, and I needed to get good grades to get into university. And I'm not one of these guys that can get good grades without working very hard. I needed to get two A's and a B. Now, for me to achieve that, I had to make a decision. Because my friends didn't, didn't need quite the same level, and they were having a really great summer. They were having a great time. And I had to look to the reward and sacrifice then to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And Moses here shows us what the Christian life looks like. If you are looking to the reward, 
You can be mistreated with the people of God or you can suffer whatever you're going through knowing there is a reward at the end for faithful service to Jesus Christ. So I encourage all of you, look to the reward. Let's not be short-sighted. And while looking to the reward, Moses becomes a type of Christ. The Old Testament heroes, if you like, point us to Jesus. Moses points us to Jesus. Here's a few similarities. Both of them, as infants, were under threat of death from the king. Herod wanted to kill Jesus. So all the baby boys of the land were to be killed. Pharaoh wanted to cull the, the Israelite population, so all the baby boys were to be killed. But both of them are protected by godly parents. If you have a child, one of your great responsibilities is to protect them from the ungodly, but not overprotect them. Give them their freedoms, but protect them from that which is ungodly. Both Jochebed and Amran and Joseph and Mary protect their baby boy. Both of them are adopted, Jesus by Joseph, and the Pharaoh's daughter adopts Moses. And both of them leave comfort, leading to people being saved. Type of Christ. This type of Christ wrote the first five books of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Give me a show of your hand if you read all five. Well done. It's a few people. Oh, well done, Selma. <laughs> all five of them. He wrote these five books. Jesus refers to the book of Exodus as the book of Moses in Mark 12. And he writes this somewhere in the 15th century BC. So when we read these words, you are reading a book three and a half millennia old. That is, that is quite old. To understand the book of Exodus, because we're going to meet a nation that are in slavery to another nation. To understand how they got there, you need to know the first book of the Bible. So I'm going to just take you on a brief history lesson through Genesis today. Some of the highlights. So Genesis, the book of beginnings, starts with the creator God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We need to know where we come from. We come from God. I shared it at the Christmas service that there's this lie going around for our young generation. And I was speaking to this guy, myself and Charlotte were witnessing to this guy on, um, on Wednesday, and so lost. He's just, just so lost. He said to me, nothing made everything. Nothing made me. To believe that is to believe that you are essentially nothing. If nothing makes you, you're nothing. There's no purpose, no value. In the beginning, God. We must understand that God is the one who makes us. In the beginning, God creates all things. He creates the heavens. He creates the earth. He creates the solar system, the galaxy. He creates the birds and the bees. He creates male and female. And he makes mankind in his image and in his likeness. And he says it's very good. We find mankind rebel against God, which is devastating, when we deliberately choose to follow that which is not of God. This has resulted in the curse that we see in effect to this day. There's a curse on the man, there's a curse on the woman, there's a curse on the devil, and the whole creation is under a curse. It then goes on to see the first murder. Cain kills Abel in Genesis 4. We see a flood that wipes out all mankind except for four men and four women. They reproduce, they fill the earth again, but they're just as bad as they were before. This week, or last week, uh, myself and Anna's car, my, my poor car, it got crashed into twice over the last month. And, and, and this week, or last Wednesday, the, the insurance guy said, look, this car is, it's not worth fixing. It's not worth investing the money in fixing this car because it is beyond repair, which is debatable, but that's what they said. They weren't willing to invest in fixing the car. 
God does not write off mankind the way the insurance company writes off cars. And he decides, I'm going to redeem this, I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this by building a nation, making a nation. And from that nation, there will come one we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ, and in whose name the whole of the earth families will be blessed and reunited to God. And he builds this nation with an unlikely character. If I was building a nation, just think about nation. What is a nation? Picture a lot of people, don't you? A lot of people. I'm going to build a nation. I'm going to build... I'm going to choose a, a, a young, handsome guy and a young, a young, a young good-looking lady who've already got five children with the capacity to build, have more children. That's who I'd pick. But God chooses a 75-year-old man and a 65-year-old woman who are unable to have children. A guy called Abram from Iraq. And he says to them, I'm going to make you into a great nation. You see, the redemption of God comes through the promise, not through our works. I'm going to make you a great nation. And he says, but this nation, jumping three chapters ahead, Genesis 15, we see the prediction of the Exodus. This nation is going to be enslaved by another nation. But I will visit you and I will bring you out. The Exodus is prophesied right at the very beginning. The nation begins with the birth of Isaac. You enjoying this history lesson? You look very serious this morning. Someone smile at me, please. <laughs> this nation starts with the birth of Isaac. Isaac is born to Abraham 25 years after the promise was made. Now just picture you being Abraham for a minute. You're 75 already. You have not had a child. You get this promise from the living God. And you're like, yes, this time, nine months, we're, we're good. No, 25 years. Yesterday at the men's morning, uh, someone said, I think it was, yeah, it was Chris, he just said, we are seeing the, f- the fulfillment of prophecies made about myself and Ruth 20 years after they were given. Is that right, Chris? Is Chris here? Sorry, 20 years. 25 years, but God always fulfills his promises. So I encourage every one of you, maybe you haven't had that promise fulfilled yet, he is faithful. He who called you is faithful. He will surely do it. 25 years. Isaac fathers Jacob, and Jacob, Jacob's name is changed by God to Israel. And Israel means God prevails. I'll tell you all this morning, God prevails. Israel is still on your map. Israel has been attempted to be wiped out many times, but it's still on your map. God prevails. Israel, or Jacob, has some sons. He's 12 sons. And we meet another type of Christ, and this is how they end up in Egypt. This other, this other type of Christ is called Joseph. Joseph, of all Jacob's sons, is the one he loves the most. He is the son the father loves. Remember last week at the baptism of Jesus, we looked at how Jesus comes up out of the water and hears those words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Joseph was the beloved son that Jacob was well pleased in. He gave him a coat of many colors. And the coat of many colors signified the love of the father for the son. The brothers hate him. They despise him. They beat him. They leave him for dead. Then he ends up getting sold into slavery and he goes into to Egypt. Just like Jesus, Joseph is brought low. He ends up in jail for a crime he did not commit. Jesus ends up in a tomb. Just like Jesus, who's raised from the dead, Joseph is promoted to being prime minister of the land and he saves the people of Egypt from famine. Joseph's brothers are starving. They come humbly to Egypt to their brother who they sold for food. Ultimately, the whole family are moved into Egypt. 
And that's how we end up in Egypt. God said to Jacob, don't be scared to go to Egypt because in Egypt I will make you into a great nation. God does things not the way we would do them. He does it in a foreign nation. He's going to make you into a great nation. Jacob or Israel dies. His brothers are terrified because his brothers have treated Joseph like dirt. And they expect the wrath of Joseph when the father is dead. They expect Joseph to turn on them and destroy them. But Joseph speaks to them with comforting words and says, I'm gonna look after you and I'm gonna look after your children. This points us to Jesus. We rebel against God. We deserve the wrath of God. And yet in Christ we get mercy and grace and peace. Your Old Testament characters point you to Jesus. 300 years pass and we end up in our chapter today. Are we all happy how we got to Egypt? Yeah? You are. Could you tell them? (laughs) These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben... Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Here we see in this book the faithfulness of God. If he promises to do something, he always does it. The people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied. To Abraham, he said, I will make you a nation. To Jacob, he says, I'm going to do it in Egypt. Seventy, seventy people plus Joseph's five relatives equals 75. That's what it starts with. There's probably, I don't know how many people are in this room. There's probably more than 75 people here. That's a pretty small number. We find in Exodus 12 that the number of just the men is over 600,000, indicating a nation of two million. I will make you a nation. He always fulfills his purposes and his promises. Two million people. This is no longer a family. This is a nation. The people of Israel were, were faithful and increased greatly. They multiplied. When they moved there, things were nice and lush because Joseph was on the, was on was in charge, but things got tough. But they still are fruitful and multiplied. And I was with Daniel Goodman in Cambridge on Friday, and he was just sharing with me um, about an article he read that shows the death, the dates of the death of all the denominations of churches in England as England becomes less and less and less Christ- Christian. And this is based on the current trends of, of people leaving the faith um, and a lack of people being saved and pretty much all all of the denominations in Britain are going to die this century unless we have a revival the vineyard new frontiers Elam and the FIEC are all not on in decline but they're not growing that fast so this nation is going to shift from being a Christian nation with a Christian heritage to a, a, a church that is, a nation is completely godless unless we see revival. I'm just going to highlight to you because we're praying and fasting for 40 days. The people of Israel multiplied and grew strong in a foreign land. And I call on us to pray that the church will grow. <laughs> Not just this church, the church <laughs> in the United Kingdom will grow to grow 
again. It gives us no pleasure to read that the Methodists are on their way out. My dear Auntie Jean's a Methodist. We want to see revival in this land. Please be stirred to pray. We need, we need it. This nation needs it. And God can do it. The people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And this king really annoys me. This is a very, very bad man. Like, you think about the, the, the people who are evil in our world today, causing the wars, and causing problems. This guy's up there with them, if not worse. He is absolutely abhorrent. This king commands the midwives of the land. If a baby born to a Hebrew is a boy, kill him. And if he is a girl, she is a girl, let her live. He is so evil. And not only is he evil, he enforces slavery on the people of God. And I have people tell me that the Bible says slavery is fine. It doesn't say that at all. There is slavery in the Bible because the Bible records what happens. But in 1 Timothy 1.10, we find out people who force people to be slaves have no place in the kingdom of heaven. This guy is absolutely awful, and he's going to get judged. But in that condition, and I've been depressed about the state of our nation recently, I've just shared with you, I'm so encouraged by this story, because we see God working beautifully, despite this guy on the throne, because the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is on the ultimate throne. God does great things. We see, we're going to see in this story that God is a God of revelation. The only way we can know God is because he calls us. He saves us. We don't find Jesus. He finds us. Jesus was never lost. We are the ones who were lost. And the story we're going to see in a few weeks of Moses at the burning bush, it's, it's a great story. We have Moses, he's just going about his business. He's looking after his, dad, his dad-in-law's sheep. And he sees this bush. He's not looking for God. He's just interested in this bush. And he goes over to this bush which is on fire. And then he hears those words, Moses. Moses. And as I was just uh, thinking about this, I, I remember being at my desk um, studying for something. It's probably the, st- probably the start of my kind of walk towards God. And I, just, I heard these words in my head. It wasn't audible. It was in my, in my head, randomly out of nowhere. Maybe God is calling you back to himself. I just remember those thoughts, random in my head. And I sort of started my journey. Maybe God's calling some of you. Moses wasn't looking for God. He was just looking at the bush. Maybe you're here today and you're just in the worship going, what's going on here? Moses went for a closer look and God spoke to him. Maybe that's you. We're going to see that God is a God of revelation and we're going to be praying over these 40 days that God calls people to himself. As he did last year, let's have some more please, Lord. We're going to see that God is a God that hears prayer and answers prayer. Exodus 2, the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery. They cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning. Groaning is a very horrible noise. I have heard it before. People in pain. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and God saw the people and God knew. I love that word, God knew. Some of you, that's your prayer life at the moment. You are crying. You are groaning. And you might look nice on a Sunday, but that's you. You're crying. You're groaning. Hear these words. God knew and God knows. And if that's your season, I would love it if we can pray for you after this service. We're going to see this call, you see. It leads to salvation. Because uh, I shared at the Christmas service Recently, I was doing an eye test, and the lady who fell over in my room in her 70s, she couldn't get up. 
She needed help to get up. The people of Israel were slaves. Just imagine what it would be like just for a moment to be a slave. When I grew up, I had a very good upbringing of my parents and I had choices. I could decide. My parents would ask me, what do you want to do when you get up, when you grow up? You can't ask your kids that if you're a slave. What do you want to do, little George, when you grow up? We had no choice. Just imagine that. They can't choose where to live. They can't choose when to have a day off. They are slaves. And we're going to see God breaks in and rescues his people from slavery. And that is how we are saved as well as Christians. Because you see, we're lost. We're slaves to sin. We can't get out of the mess we're in. And God in Christ comes and rescues us. We're going to see a God who saves. We're going to see a God who shows himself to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Another thing the story of Moses is famous for is the plagues. And we're going to see in the plagues of Egypt how God is judging the deities of Egypt. You see, we live in a land where there's a lot of gods worshipped. There's a lot of gods worshipped in our land. There's a lot of demonic gods worshipped in our land. There's a lot of materialistic gods worshipped in our land. Things like sex are worshipped in our land. But I'm telling you, our God is above all these gods. He is the only one capable of saving and he's the only one who's all-powerful. The goddess of the Nile could not stop the God of the Bible turning the river into blood. And we're going to look at how God judges the gods of Egypt. And we're going to look at how God judges his enemies. You don't want to be an enemy of our God. We're all enemies at the start, but you want to be in you want to be in Christ. You want to be in him because the Egypt is going to be judged. And you're going to see God judge the enemies of his people and himself. And we're going to see that God's desire is for a people of his own possession. Exodus chapter 6. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will be your people. You will be my people. I will be your God. And the apostle Peter says that of the church. He says we are a holy nation. A people for his own possession. Who he's called out of darkness into his marvelous light. He is still after a people. We are his people. Let's live like his people. And we're going to see a God who loves to dwell amongst his people. The presence of God is something that we, we just treasure here in this church. Uh, Sam led us in a song about the Holy Spirit being welcoming here and falling on us. We want to be a church where the presence of God is tangible. I was in a house um, in Cambridge uh, with, a, with a couple um, called, called Ian and Kate on, on a Friday night. And the first place I saw this was Edward and Elizabeth's house. Are they here today? Hi, Edward. I went into their house as a 21-year-old, and I just felt the presence of God in that house. I didn't know what the presence of God was, but I felt the, something different in that house. And I learned later on what that was, because in, in other people's houses, or around other people, I felt the presence of God. And in this house in Cambridge, I felt the presence of God, and I want this, this, this church to be full of the presence of God. He's free to do whatever he wants here. The people of Israel were led in a visible manner, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. We want the presence of God to be visible here. And that's what we're going to learn as we look at this story. So you've had a history lesson today. We've seen that God can work despite difficult situations. And we're going to see all these things as we discover this book together. As a way of response, I would love it all if you can start to read the book of Exodus. Just start reading it. It's a good story. And I want to pray for some people. Sam, can we come back to worship, please? Thank you. I want to uh, pray for a few people. I think Becky had a, a word. I think you're going to share now. 
Do you want to come on up? This would be something we respond to. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. I don't know exactly what it is, but I've heard it's good. <laughs> no pressure. Um, just feel like God's been talking to me a lot about hope and having hope in him. And um, a verse that keeps coming up is uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And I just really feel like there might be some here who maybe, beginning of this year, life just isn't what you thought it was going to look like, or life is just tough and hard. But actually, just know that God has plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Thank, thank you, Becky. So if that's you, um, maybe you're in that season of, of groaning, God knows, hope restored. We're going to pray for you there. Becky will pray for you. <laughs> Abraham waited 25 years for the promise. If you're in a season of when is this going to come into be, I want to pray for you as well. Moses, looking to the reward, was willing to leave the palace of Egypt. If you're distracted and you need your eyes refocused on your purpose and the things of God, I want to pray for you. And if you're not a Christian and you want to start that walk with the Lord, Moses, or Joseph's brothers came to Joseph. They deserved Joseph to turn on them, but Joseph showed them mercy and grace. If you're not yet a Christian and you want to know mercy and grace, come to the front. I want to pray for you too. I'll remind you about these things as we go through the worship. But otherwise, if you could stand with me, I'd just love to pray for you. Hmm. Yeah, Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for uh, your words, Lord, to us. We thank you for the story of Moses, Lord. How you called a man who was not looking for you and you used him for incredible things. And Father, I just want to pray that as we look at this book together, Lord... Father, as we look at this book together, you would take us on a journey, Lord. That, Father, we would see you this year reveal yourself to people as you did to Moses. That we'd see you hear and answer our prayers as we groan, Lord, as we pray, Father, for, for ourselves, for the church, for our families, for the nation, Lord God. That, Father, you would renew hope, Father, in people who have been waiting a very long time for answered prayer, answered promises, Lord God. We thank you that you never fail, that you are a good, good God. And Father, I pray for those here who don't yet know you. Like Moses, they're having a little look. I encourage them to come closer, Lord, that they could hear your voice calling them out of darkness into your light. In Jesus' name, amen.